Tara, you, you kind of went on the regional way in California, right? You created a regional um, network. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose the regional and, and what were the pitfalls that you found or what you think is easier than just going for a smaller city? Sure. Uh, and I should say, you know, uh, as you may know, I was in the uh, cabinet of uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in, uh, in California, so I had the benefit of having worked for somebody who came back from the future and told me how this is all <laughs> going to turn out. Um, and, uh, and so we understood that what we needed to do as a, as a regional government was, oh, okay, sorry. Um, maybe that's why the joke didn't get a better laugh. No, so we realized that uh, government had a role to play in reducing some of the barriers. And the most obvious one has been discussed at this uh, conference already, the chicken or the egg situation. Right which is uh, that the fuel companies don't want to put out the fueling stations until they see cars, car companies don't want to produce more cars until they see the fuel. Uh, and then you also had things like fire marshals who were saying, wait a minute, we don't care if the fuel and the cars come together, we're not going to let you put a combustible gas like hydrogen, for example, or charging stations at 440 volts in the middle of our cities without knowing what the, what the safety record is likely to be. So the state is the logical place to start setting some of those uh, standards, but also when I was EPA secretary, I pulled together a coalition of 200 stakeholders from energy companies, from car companies, from government itself, from academics, from the finance community, and said, let's map this out together so that we can all agree at what pace the stations are going to be needed. Let's work with consumer groups to, to make sure we understand what the uptake will be. And the net result is that today, in fact, I invite any of you to come to Los Angeles. I'll be very happy to pick you up at the airport in my hydrogen-powered Honda uh, Clarity or uh, my uh, F-Cell, which is the Mercedes version of that. Uh, electric car powered by hydrogen. Stations are, uh, are sufficiently abundant in California that I can drive anywhere in the state. And that's all as a result of uh, getting people together at the state level and creating a big enough market for, uh, for hydrogen and doing the same thing then with charging stations for electric. Uh, the, the state also had been an early adopter of things like flex fuel vehicles for ethanol, but there weren't enough ethanol stations. We bought the cars and there weren't any stations, so we had to facilitate that. And again, all of that was just easier to do at a larger regional level to get the players to say, okay, yeah, it's California. It's a pretty big market. We'll come there rather than it being a smaller local market. I'm just wondering what, what were the difficulties? I mean, it seems like you did so much. Like you said, you got the cars, you didn't have the fuel. How did you push it forward? I mean, how, was there, a, there wasn't a national backing, there was only a state backing, I mean, there were the voters, I mean, how did that work? Well, we did a couple things, and, and at the risk of being a shameless self-promoter of, of this <laughs> book, Lives Per Gallon, The True Cost of Our Oil Addiction, I'm gonna give this actually to Ayal if he's still here later. Uh, of the Fuels Choice Initiative because it actually, although it's got an ominous title, it has a happy ending. It lays out exactly how we did it. But the reason I'm plugging this is because we started by explaining to the population what was at risk. And in California, we understood this because I would argue we invented smog. We also invented a lot of the solutions to, to smog and to air pollution. But we understood that 100,000 people die prematurely in the United States from petroleum-related air pollution. We communicated that to our citizens. We understand that, in fact, when you go to the, to the gasoline pump in the United States, you don't pay 3 or $4 a gallon. You pay 10 or $11 a gallon when you factor in health care costs, defending oil around the globe, tax breaks, which the oil companies don't need anymore. So you know, I summarized all that in the book. And again, pardon my shameless uh, uh, plug for the book. But, but I think the first thing that you have to do is explain to people what's at stake. Then you get their support, whether it is with, uh, for example, there was a ballot measure that uh, created what's called a little public goods charge where you put a little money on, a, on an electric bill or a, at, at the pump. Mm -hmm. And then it's a very small amount of money for any individual consumer, but collectively it can be used to incentivize the vehicles, to incentivize the charging stations, and to kind of prime the pump to get things started so the marketplace can follow. And now if we can move to Berlin. And, and, and we were talking a little bit earlier about the socialization of this and how it works in Berlin and how you know, peer to peer and all kinds of uh, different programs that you're putting in place. And you have, I think, probably one of the biggest city electric car fleets, right? Who's one talk? Sure, um, uh, I, I'll uh, just lean in slightly differently because I okay. think that um, uh, uh, while we are addicted to oil, <coughs> I think we're also addicted to the private automobile. And right. I think if we look back at uh, historically at how we organize cities in Europe in particular, um, I think the private automobile will be a short blip in the history of urban mobility. 
um, because you couldn't really set out to design a worse, techno a worse technological solution to the issue of people mobility in cities than the uh, combustion-propelled private automobile. Um, uh, you know, 90% of cars are stationary 90% of, of the time. Uh, they have one person in them 90% of the time and an extremely low uh, primary energy utilization. Um, all the parking space that's being eaten up, all the materials and capital that's locked into these stationary vehicles um, is a huge underutilization of all the uh, factors that go into uh, 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 producing cars and the car system. So really what we need to look at is, is whether we can switch over before we even talk about fuel. Fuel is really a tertiary issue in urban mobility. Before we start looking at fuel, we need to look at the social organization of mobility. Um, if we can actually move people onto what we call mobility on demand system, which generally describes the integration of car sharing, bike sharing with public transport, thus giving users, and we call them transport users rather than consumers, um, the ability to choose from a whole portfolio of transport options in real time at any given moment, um, they really um, have no need to retain a private vehicle. And so really we want to move from private automobiles to individual automobility. And that's, that really was the starting point of the projects that we run in Berlin. And uh, uh, I work for an innovation center that uh, works with both industry, Siemens, the German railways, but also some of the top research institutes in Germany. Uh, and we have uh, circulating in Berlin now 700 EVs in two separate car sharing schemes, um, electric car sharing schemes, both station-based and spontaneous use. Um, but these are fully integrated with the public transport system um, and the user by smartphone or with a smart card can essentially buy a flat rate monthly subscription that allows him to access whenever he wants to either mass transport, public transport, or an, a bicycle or a, a car sharing car. Um, the other aspect there is just that we're trying to look at uh, mobility as a component of the overall energy system as well. Uh, as, as you will know, we're aiming to get to 100% renewable uh, uh, power, at least in Germany, in the, in the next few decades. And um, one of the biggest issues there isn't really generation, it's storage. Um, and of course, electric mobility can play a, a, a unique role in providing a load shedding and storage capacity to a local decentralized um, renewable power system. And, and that's the other component that we're working on, looking at whether we can generate locally the energy that we need to propel uh, these vehicles. Um, I'll make a final point there that the other issue we need to look at again before we look at fuels is actually the design of the vehicles. Um, uh, uh, my German colleagues won't like this, but of course, um, uh, you know, we are designing cars that weigh two tons that can travel 200 kilometers an hour. Um, it's complete nonsense for the city. You're not even allowed to drive faster than 50 uh, kilometers. If we make them lighter, smaller, uh, we need less energy to propel them, i.e. we need smaller batteries, we can bring the cost down. So all of this is, are things we need to look at before we even start looking at the fuel issue. Um, and I think in the particular situation in Germany, um, there is a, a very nice synergy now between generating renewable energy um, and using electric fleets of electric cars to store them. Final example I might give is the region around Berlin is now at 60% and its power mix is from renewables. Um, we could uh, make Berlin 100% renewable by 2030 if we can uh, design the city as a distributed energy storage system and, and bringing together those infrastructure levels of mobility transfer, but also smart buildings. Well, to do that, you'd need a lot of money, and I guess that brings us to the next question. How do you finance this? I mean, what, how does that work? Private, public, how does that work? Does anyone talk about their experience? Want to start? Sure. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. I think we have a, a problem now that we have a system state of EA, and we need to move to a system state D, and the, mm -hmm. the, the transformation costs are, are difficult, and also how they're distributed. On the other hand, if we look at the price of, at the cost, and you've just mentioned them, the cost of our existing automotive petrochemical industry, um, and, uh, uh, and we can release some of those infrastructure costs by reducing the overall amount of vehicles, by releasing uh, productive space into the urban landscape, then we can release capital on one hand that we can then switch over into designing these systems. Um, we can also socialize the initial cost of acquisition of EVs by um, introducing them into fleets of car sharing, which means that the individual consumer doesn't have to shoulder the entire capex. Um, and this is one strategy that we're deploying in Germany to try and bring up the fleets of EVs. Um, the other one is, is to look at, um, of course, um, where you can have um, uh, uh, targeted subsidies. In Germany, the, the federal government, government has decided not to subsidize vehicle acquisition, um, but is subsidizing the, um, uh, uh, the creation of these fleets via other means. Um, so you do need uh, central government support, and um, we've, been, uh, we've had a great program in place in Germany, and I think some of my colleagues were speaking yesterday on this, where uh, we have a national platform on electric mobility. All the different stakeholders come together, and the federal government has put in 
something in the order of one and a half billion dollars in the last few years to pilot and scale up fleets of electric vehicles. I think, Bobby, you told me something about freeing up land to make it less expensive to create these alternative stations. Well, I, I, you know, I'm going to give a couple thoughts that are slightly contradictory to uh, the thoughts themselves, but also the, the things up here. I think that, um, you know, from freeing up money, right, that's where I think where Terry's talking about, like, the larger issue and the, the idea of, uh, you know, why this matters to our society and to our countries, you know, the cost of oil security or pollution. That's where that argument matters at a government level. But from a consumer, and so that's where I think you can free up money because, you know, we are sp expending. I mean, you've heard all the numbers from the Minister of Energy and everyone today, right? I mean, the amount of money we're spending on these things and how much you can save uh, writ large. But from a consumer perspective, unfortunately, I don't know if that really matters. Um, you know, it's great to think that telling people to eat their broccoli and peas will work. But we've found that that doesn't work at all. In our Orlando project, we did focus groups, for example. And uh, we did that in Chicago, which is the largest feeder, feeder, the largest feeder city into, uh, into Orlando. And the truth is that no one wants to hear about those things. They just want a car that drives better, that gives them better performance. Um, and so look at the Tesla, you know, which is, uh, you know, basically provides a better consumer experience. Someone once said to me once, you know, the thing about internal combustion engines, it's a great uh, it's a lousy car with a great fuel, and the thing about uh, uh, electric cars or uh, some other cars, it's a great uh, car with a lousy fuel, so to speak. Um, and I think that that's true. So you have to provide a better... Con people just want fun, and it meets their daily demand. And so I think that uh, those two things. And then the final statement, I, I, and so I think it matters on a government level to make one argument, and on a consumer level, it's a totally different argument. And then the last thing I'd say is just how much money is really needed. And that, that, that matters to which solution you go with as a country or the choice you want to provide people. And, you know, I tend to believe that um, some of these solutions don't require a lot of money. I mean, certainly in the electric space, money, it, you, you need some infrastructure, but infrastructure is, 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 uh, is sort of a necessary, but it's, it's not the sufficient factor to get people to go buy the cars, all these other things I'm talking about. And those, you know, everyone's got electricity in their home. That's why, the, that's why it's such a compelling proposition to so many, so many people now. And as we get hydrogen fuel cells, you know, that's electric transport. Now, some of these other solutions take more money. You've got to get new pumps, and you've got to do... Um, and that, that's, that's the question of how much money you need. But I don't think all transportation alternatives require lots of money. And I certainly think there's alternative financial means. I mean, there's companies now that are working in the fleet space like they did in the building space, where they're ESCOs where they say, we'll front the money, mm -hmm. we'll buy you the car, but we share on the savings afterwards. And so I, I just think that it's a bat matter of the financial community catching up to, the, um, to these new technologies. And, and if I could just, uh, if I could just uh, add to that, and Robbie, a friendly amendment to what you said, I would agree uh, that consumers and governments look at these differently, but since this is a government panel, I would say this is where the government sometimes has to say, here's your broccoli and here's how you're going to have to eat it, meaning uh, and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. So, for example, in California, we pay about 18 cents a gallon state tax and 18 cents uh, federal tax, so 36 cents uh, per gallon of tax on, on, our, uh, on our gasoline. Well, if you took that same amount on other fuels, whether it's a charging station or whether it's a hydrogen station or, or biofuels, uh, and use that to repay the infrastructure costs. Um, and you could even increase that a little bit. What if it was 50 cents? I mean, we've seen the price of gasoline in California go from $2.50 to $5 over the course of the last three, four years, and up and down, just as the, as the world oil prices change. So there, despite the fact it's not popular to say it, the truth is there is a lot of flexibility in consumer acceptance of that price. So if you put a, a reasonable tax on these alternatives in order to help uh, finance the early investment that's necessary, you can also use a lot of things that the taxpayers have already paid for. Uh, you mentioned land as an example. In California, one of the things we did with our hydrogen highway network, which was an effort to get these stakeholders together, was we said, well, what would happen if our State Department of Transportation and our university campuses had some extra land that they could uh, allow uh, private providers to put stations on. That, that cut a huge part of the cost out of providing the infrastructure and it gave, especially in the case of university uh, campuses, it gave a great place to teach people about what was going on. Can I, can I just amend one thing? I mean, we're sitting in Israel where private capital spent in better place, you know, $800 million dollars now, it wasn't all spent here. Maybe that was half their problem. They should have focused here only. But the point is, like, this country is actually sitting on one of these infrastructures that have been built by private money. 
And yet the question is, is like, is it being utilized and who's going to utilize it? Well, we talked about the, education. the education. Uh, Remember you brought up the idea of education before. But, you know, the government has this tremendous asset that investors from around the world paid for, for this country. And I think that's a good question, you know, for, this, for the government here, which is, okay, you now are sitting on this uh, countrywide infrastructure, quote-unquote, deployment community. Um, someone's <coughs> paid for it already. Okay, what are you going to do with it? So I, I just think that's an important question for us to ask. I also wanted to bring up what I think Robbie said before was that you have all these different uh, charging stations on the street and then you know, a regular combustible car will park there. So they, here comes along the guy who owns an electric car, he can't charge his car. So I mean, if we're going back to also preparing the consumer, which you guys are all talking about, I mean, you put in infrastructure, you've got to have you know, the consumer ready, you have to have the municipality ready to enforce these new kind of rules. So there's a whole network. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of, I guess, free work that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that one has to differentiate between different regions of the world. I mean, I think if we look at the, the history of the car, the Model T was designed for interurban travel between small farming towns, and you know the settlement patterns in the U.S. are vastly different from the from Europe. So I think there are different solutions will have to apply. I think that if you look at European cities, the, a lot of that infrastructure uh, has been funded already in forms of public transport infrastructure. So it's obviously easier. I mean, we now have 50% of households in Berlin that don't even own a car anymore. The modal split is about 30% as, as, as motorized vehicles. And actually in a number of other cities like Hong Kong or Mumbai or, or Delhi or, or, or London even, that, that's about the same modal split. So I think in those settings, it's more about enhancing the public transport infrastructure and we're moving towards a co-production of public transport between private providers of multimodal individual uh, mobility services together with mass transit options that the government is funding. So I think that's a slightly different issue in terms of the, the, the infrastructure. I would caution though a little bit that, um, that we don't replicate now the mistake we did with, uh, uh, with the automotive inter infrastructure, that we essentially plow through our cities and over-engineer a technological solution that services a technological platform. I mean, the car is there to burn oil and then we design cities to accommodate the car but not people's mobility. So I think we need to, once we start now talking about sustainable transport, not commit ourselves to, to the same mistake and fetishizing one technological fuel option over another, but think more about how do we design urban space to, to allow for more intelligent traffic and transport flows. Um, but I, I completely accept that this is a slightly different issue in different countries, and each country will probably have to find its own, own solution to this. But, but that's also, I think, a great opportunity for, again, to your question on the panel here about what do cities do. So in San Francisco, uh, a study showed that about a third of vehicle miles traveled in the city are people driving around in circles looking for a parking space. Now, in part, that was because the city had made parking so expensive and so difficult to get to try to encourage people to go on the rapid transit system. So they created their own problem. But, uh, but then, you know, now there's technological solutions where street light poles are being designed to be able to automatically detect where the empty spaces are, and then you, you know, you get something on your mobile phone that tells you where to go. Uh, and then, of course, it also allows the city to charge for parking automatically and, and uh, charge you if you overstay, which may not be popular with some consumers, but, but certainly is better as a revenue source for the city. So I think, you know, we need to start using, harnessing some of our other technologies to make better use of, you know, as you said before, to, to just make it more transportation on demand. And when you do have a car and you do need a parking space, let's not spend 20 minutes looking for a space and, and tying up traffic, but let's actually have something like Uber that we have in many parts of the world where you just turn on your smartphone and you say, I need a taxi, I need a car, I need a car share, I need to know if I want to get to the airport on a bus, how long will it take Absolutely. me? Uh, that's really, I think, uh, how we can solve a lot of these problems. And, and that's how we can pull in the, the user. It's, it's user-generated transport right. transformation. And I think that's, that's where I would agree with you. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, since we're on, uh, sorry, if you can mind, a couple of thoughts. Uh, I was just asking, in terms of the, um, if you drove out in terms of on a Thursday evening, you go out to your car, where do you decide to be in your car to find space back home? I mean, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, or an hour, and I spent this the other week trying to find space. Uh, Cars to satisfy every single family in your city. How, how do you finance that? How do you cover it? 
Yes, no, very good question. We always get that question. I call it the IKEA question. What do I do when I want to go to IKEA? <laughs> um, but, uh, I, you know, actually a lot of families I know in Berlin don't own cars, and actually they then rent uh, by a car sharing service, and you can book a car in advance, or you can pick one up spontaneously, and we have four-seater cars. We have cars that uh, are slightly bigger. If they're not electric, you can even get a uh, uh, sort of an estate-type uh, car. So I think those are issues that, that are, that are non-issues, really, if you have the right vehicle uh, uh, choice. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the amount of vehicles, of course, you're absolutely right. If you're proceeding from a, an urban space where there's no public transport infrastructure, to then switch completely to car sharing is going to be a tall order. I agree. Uh, in Berlin, we have a completely different situation. We're really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to convince, um, we have what we call metro mobiles. These are people that 90% uh, of the time use public transport but still have that car parked outside of their home for that IKEA moment. And, and that's economic nonsense. And you know, it's very easy to make to them the value proposition. Look, don't spend all that on insurance, parking, tax, um, repairs, fuel, um, capex that you're spending on this fastly depreciating vehicle. If you can just offer them the ability to pick up a car as and when they need it, it's actually cost efficient. So really, you, it doesn't work unless you have a public transport uh, backbone. And I think this is our argument that we have to focus on intelligent public transport backbones and we have to supplement that with first and last mile issues via a, a plethora of vehicles, not just cars, electric bicycles, two wheels, three wheels. We need to miniaturize uh, uh, and create micro vehicles for the city as well, but also have those cars for the, for the families as and when they need them. This is also, though, where government does play a role uh, in, again, I'll just use some California cities as an example, but I've seen this elsewhere. In Los Angeles and Oakland, for example, and up until recently in San Francisco, uh, the mass transit stopped a mile or a mile and a half from the airport. And that's because there was a strong lobby by the taxi operators and the shuttle operators uh, who prevented that from happening. And so you actually couldn't get to, if you had your family of four or if you were just were yourself with your, with your suitcase, you couldn't actually get there without getting on a variety of different bits of transportation. So you said, oh, the hell with it, I'll take my car and park it at the airport. So this is where government has got to be a little more enlightened and put its foot down and say, no, we're going to do what's good for the, for the greater good. And then that helps people make these choices and not have to decide whether or not they're going to get a big car for their big family or a big car for their solar, solo driver. So uh, yesterday we heard from the, the opening comments of, this, of, the, uh, of the entire conference were from the mayor of, of Tel Aviv. And, uh, and Elliot, correct me if I've got this wrong, because you know the local situation better, but he was complaining that they couldn't uh, charge for parking locally because of, I think it was national uh, regulation. So I guess my question is... And uh, they couldn't have congestion charging either. Exactly. Couldn't have congestion charging either because it was out of their jurisdiction. So I guess my question is sort of a general one, but maybe you can, within that framework. How often do we run from... Do municipalities sort of run up against these kinds of problems where you, you can only do so much uh, because you're a city and you're part of a state or a country uh, that has different perspectives on how to go about regulating. Sure. I mean, uh, Michael Bloomberg ran up uh, against this very problem in New York when he tried to introduce congestion pricing uh, and, uh, and wasn't able to do it because of uh, state regulation, amongst other things. So I, that is a problem. And coordinating among the different levels of government, whether it's national or state to your, to your local city, is a big problem. But, you know, cities have a tremendous amount of power. And it really, if you have a charismatic leader, if you have somebody who's got the vision and is willing to, to go to it, the state government or the federal government and try to get these changes made, make the case to the public, uh, get consumer groups involved, uh, and go lobby, it's amazing what can happen. Yeah, I would just uh, note, like in northern Colorado, we're working. Um, they just had to pass a law to uh, sort of equalize for all alternative vehicles, the same sort of tax credits. Uh, for fleets, they just had to change the laws that uh, plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles would get the same thing. And it was really our efforts with the mayors who came out to the state and said, look, we need this for our city. So I think the mayors have a lot of power because they're so close to the people to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to be leading uh, voices on this thing. I would just add one thing that's sort of not been talked about when you think about technology going forward. Uh, look, I think the self-driving car is a big thing that's going to happen. It's going to happen a lot quicker than we think. It's going to happen in trucks very quickly so that they don't bump up against people. And I think you're going to start seeing it. And when you get to that point, um, when you look at Uber, which is, you know, you can order your car and, and these car sharing, look, people are not going to want to own their cars. 
Electric vehicles are going to make a lot of sense because you can right size the battery. So you can say, I'm going 20 miles and I got a family of four. And it's going to drive you a car to your house that has all those things that's going to drop you off, drive over some inductive charger somewhere, and be ready for the next thing. And they'll have cars that are different sizes and that are go 20 miles and 30 miles and 40 miles and 50 miles. And I think that self-driving, although far, far away, and we need fuel choice now because of the, you know, the security problem in OPEC, but I would keep my eye on that ball and the regulations that are needed to drive that forward, which I think make a lot of these technologies a lot easier because a lot of the uh, technologies can be cheaper if you, uh, if you right-size them for the right appropriate time. Robbie, that's a great point because, you know, if you stop and think about it, my wife's grandmother is 106 years old. So when she was born, the predominant form of transportation was still the horse and buggy. But by the time she was 10 years old, the predominant form of transportation was motorized. That happened in a 10-year period with 100-year-old technology. So when you look at, like you say, the ability to grab your smartphone and demand that car today, these things are going to happen a lot faster than we can predict. And I think it's, it's turning the car from an ace social medium into a more networked uh, 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 mobility platform. And, and, so maybe, I couldn't agree more. and maybe it will work as more people are so used to the internet and the sharing and so on. And, and, and Ravi, I know you have this kind of uh, cyber game that people play on the security side of it. I mean, would you consider doing some kind of social networking game where people could get on and think, well, how would this work? I wanted to go from here to here, and I'm going to, just the kind of type of scenario that you were explaining, maybe someone could get on and kind of play a game, see how it would work for them, and that would be an education kind of tool. Yeah, so I think, you know, we have this oil game called Oil Shockwave where you take a cabinet and run them through an oil crisis, and we've done it with real cabinet members. You know, what you discover very quickly is, uh, one, it's a global market, and so anything happens anywhere affects you uh, everywhere, which is what we've been talking about the last day and a half. But the other thing you see is that once in a crisis, there's really nothing you can do because all these solutions take so much uh, time. Um, and so you're, yeah, every, cabinet, every cabinet we've ever done this with always says, well, I wish they'd done that 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think that, uh, that that's from the education side. But, you know, what you're saying, and, you know, it's not even my generation. It's the generation, you know, after me. What's so amazing is like how few people when they turn 16 now go get a license. I, I, it's so shocking to me. I was like the first person in line. It's shocking to me how few people want to own a car. And yes, I, what I don't know is when they get the families. Like I always say, I do not want a minivan. Whatever I do, I do not want a minivan. <laughs> and then you actually have kids and you're like, oh God, maybe I need a minivan. <laughs> but so like what happens? But I do think that there is a, there is a, a psychological social revolution kind of going on behind us. And I think that will have this, this question of, like you say, the social impact and how do you do, do that. Do you want to open it up to the floor? Is there any uh, questions? Well, no, we've, uh, I think we're just about uh, out of time. Um, so I guess just to thank uh, Gwen uh, Ackerman for her uh, moderating, Bureau Chief for uh, Bloomberg News, Israel and the Palestinian Territories. And also thank you to Terry Taminen, the president and founder of Seventh Generation Advisors, former advisor to the uh, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Does he still drive a hydrogen-powered Hummer? He does. He does. There you go. Uh, <laughs> also to Flor uh, Florian Lennart, academic director of Inoz Innovation Center for M Mobility and Societal Change, and to uh, Robbie Diamond, the uh, CEO of SAFE. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.